Thanks a lot, Eric, yeah, for joining the talk. So we are very happy to have Xue Chen Li from Stanford University today to give us a talk on his recent research on differentially private deep learning models. Xue Chen is currently a PhD student at Stanford CS. And uh, during his relatively short period of time in terms of the research, so he had published quite interesting works in the domain of uh, trustworthy AI, especially the differential privacy part of deep learning. So uh, without further ado, so Xue Chen, the floor is yours. Please go ahead. Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, so uh, uh, several fun facts before uh, the talk. So I actually go by Chen, which is the second component of my last name because people have a hard time pronouncing my first name. Um, uh, I get a, I guess a bit of a disclaimer is that uh, uh, I'm in this uh, Pacific time zone and it's currently uh, 6 30 a.m. So not the uh, uh, best of time, but uh, hopefully this will go through smoothly. Um, OK, and and uh, by the way, feel free to uh, ask questions directly um, or in the chat, um, but I won't be able to monitor the chat because uh, once I'm in this presenter mode, it's just uh, this screen, screen of slides. So uh, feel free to uh, interrupt at any time. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some recent developments, um, some recent works that I've done that I've done with collaborators, um, both at Stanford and MSR, on getting differentiated private deep learning to work better. Um, and yeah, so the talk will be roughly um, 40 to 50 minutes, and I'll leave some time for uh, questions at the end. So. Uh, um, I, I guess uh, people here are mostly working in this space, so we probably mostly know that you know large neural networks memorize, and this is one of the core motivations of um, why we want to work on uh, things in this space. So, you know, the first thing that people think about is that there are certain privacy risks, and uh, one of the several motivating examples um, is that you know GPT two, if you query it. Um, it'll be able to actually regurgitate or reproduce some information that is considered uh, personal or private. And then uh, there are really these awkward cases where um, people have actually gone to train, let's say, chatbots with uh, user data and found out later that they can regurgitate um, it, sensitive information such, that, such as people's names um, and addresses. Um, and we've been uh, working on this recent um, project, which really touches on intellectual property and copyright. And as a matter of fact, um, some of these recent large scale models, um, such as OPT 175 billion, which is the Facebook open source uh, reproduction of um, GPT 3 175 billion. So, this auto regressively pre trained language model can actually, in certain cases, um, regurgitate very famous books. And here is one example where uh, we ran some extraction attacks and it turns out that uh, just by feeding a prompt, um, asking the model um, you know, to regurgitate this book, which is called, Oh, The Places You'll Go, which is like a famous children's book, um, turns out that you could get large chunks of verbatim text. So uh, the other fun thing is that uh, there are cases where um, if you run the extraction attacks, um, sometimes you'll get inexact uh, copying. And uh, we ended up running some extraction attacks with uh, uh, code models. And this is, uh, this is in particular one of the codex models. And uh, we've run this uh, metric or detection algorithm called MOS, which is originally developed by a professor at Stanford. Um, and this is widely used in plagiarism detection. If you've, let's say, TA'd a course, you might heard of it or used it. Um, and it turns out that, you know, sometimes the models don't exactly regurgitate the reference, but it's close enough that it should be considered as plagiarism in the context of online learning or um, in general grading homeworks. Yeah, so um, the bulk of this talk is going to be about differential privacy. Um, and the reason we, we like to study um, methods in this space is that uh, differential privacy, first of all, is a formal notion of privacy. And it really enables people to think about privacy leakage um, of things like composition and post-processing in a very principled way. 
Um, in addition, DP is essentially this gold standard for statistical analysis with private data, and it has really stood against the test of time. Um, so it wouldn't make sense if uh, this talk was about DP, but uh, there was no DP definition. So I'm just you know repeating the definition here, but uh, I'm, I'm sure most of us have seen this uh, here. Um, obviously there are lots of variants um, like FDP, Gaussian DP, Rainy DP, but I'm including here the most basic version, which is uh, one from the original works, which is just epsilon delta DP or approximate DP. Um, and the intuition of why this guarantee makes sense is also fairly obvious um, in hindsight, in the sense that if you consider two databases, which would differ in a single entry, and if you were to train machine learning models, um, one model for each of the databases, in the end, you should get two models that are really hard to distinguish probabilistically by some adversary. So what are the opportunities and challenges here? So it turns out that there were a collection of past works which show that models trained with DP guarantees are very resistant to privacy attacks. Um, and turns out that DP is um, shown to be empirically much more effective than standard regularizers, um, such as dropout, weight decay, uh, and quantization methods. Um, but the downside is that training with DP had been really shown uh, in the past literature to be um, giving tasks at low task performance and typically has high computational cost. Um, so what happened was that, you know, these challenges had really discouraged the adoption of DP in machine learning um, and it led to a lot of researchers to consider um, some more relaxed notion of privacy, some of which um, aren't really based on formal guarantees. So uh, let's go a little bit deeper into some of the challenges here. Um, so the first challenge is really about um, the privacy utility trade-off or uh, colloquially, um, people talk about it as DP uh, giving bad performance. Um, so the idea was that many past attempts at training NLP models with DP um, either did not result in good, good task performance under uh, you know small or reasonable epsilon budgets, or only tended to work for data sets that are very large. Um, and you could sort of see that before 2021, um, you know people did try some of these um, uh, DP methods um, for training language models and uh, the results really weren't super encouraging. And uh, this is one example where uh, you might in the end have uh, perplexity on the order of thousands. So the other pillar of the set of challenges is really the computational efficiency. So DP training is uh, reported to be slow and memory intensive, which is uh, a major a blocker for uh, any practitioner who doesn't want to spend a lot of time on these algorithms to adopt these. So uh, to give some concrete evidence, you know, um, you know, this is a fairly established work and turns out that uh, um, with a naive, with, with sort of a simpler implementation, you could get something that is 10 to 100 times slower. Um, and, uh, you know, Opacus, which is this uh, DP machine learning library based on PyTorch, um, in their documentation, they'll tell you that um, if you want to train uh, with batch size 64, you're, lo you're looking to keep 64 copies of your parameter gradient, um, implying that you might run into memory issues. Uh, later, we'll see that this isn't actually the case. You could actually bypass this issue. Um, and, you know, uh, there's some works which uh, really try to uh, strive to uh, train large models uh, with distributed training, and uh, it's really hard uh, to get things to fit in memory just because of the uh, per example gradient issue. Okay, so... Um, now we sort of arrive at this uh, outline slide. So um, the bulk of this talk is gonna be about uh, a bunch of techniques which improve the practicality of differentiated private deep learning. Um, and the first thing we're gonna touch on really is the privacy utility trade-off. And uh, um, there are two works. Um, one is currently um, under review on this topic. Um, 
And then I'm going to talk about ways to uh, control uh, or really reduce um, the computational overhead and improve the efficiency. So um, one interesting and more academic question is that um, um, fine tuning hundreds of millions of parameters um, really work well in practice, it seems. Um, and there are uh, more evidence and follow-up works on some of these uh, works in computer vision. Um, and the idea here is that a lot of past works, um, they had suggested that, um, you know, if you look at things from a theoretical point of view, if you, you know, take a convex model, then you might get uh, the analytical or, or uh, uh, the results by doing analysis that in the end, you get something that scales with dimension. Um, and there's also uh, some empirical works, which, you know, look at what's called signal to noise ratio. And you'll see that the noise essentially um, drowns the signal in terms of magnitude, in terms of Euclidean norm. So the fun question really is, you know, why does it, uh, why does fine tuning large scale models work in practice, um, where in many cases you might be fine tuning, you know, hundreds of millions of parameters, sometimes even billions. Okay, um, so we all know that privacy um, would uh, give you certain undesirable trade-offs. And um, one of them people had touched on is fairness, but uh, in this work, we'll touch on a different aspect, which is uh, what we call the privacy calibration trade-off. Uh, it's also something that is uh, fun to cover uh, because there are a lot of unexpected observations. Um, in the end, we'll uh, talk a little bit about ethics and include the summary on that, um, uh, summary of our work essentially. Okay. Okay, before I go ahead, uh, are there any questions? Okay, it seems we're all good. Okay, so we'll start with the privacy utility trade off. So, um, one of the important things that we found through experiments is that. Um, you know, most passwords trained with train models from scratch with DP. Um, by scratch, I really mean, you know, they just initialize a ran model randomly and train that. Um, and the idea here is that um, it, it seems really hard that you'd get good performance um, from doing this. And some of the reasons are that um, you're relying on your private data to learn high level features for computer vision, say, um, or linguistics for NLP. Um, and uh, regarding some of the results, you could see that, um, this is a work from late 2021, I believe, um, sorry, late 2020, early 2021. And you can really see that um, by training from scratch, it, it, um, it's really hard to get very um, good performance. And here you could see that um, the, the performance that you get um, by training CIFAR, by training CIFAR on CIFAR with the epsilon equals to three is around 70%. And in comparison, you could uh, sort of recall some standard numbers in your head. Um, uh, most of the approaches in standard training usually would give you above 90% accuracy. <clears throat> so um, the idea really is quite simple. So instead of learning this general knowledge like edge detectors um, or linguistics uh, or general language pattern with limited private data, we can actually pre-train uh, with self-supervised learning on mildly created public data. And the, uh, the, the reason that we really want self-supervised learning is that um, you don't really need that much task-specific annotation. Um, and, and you're not really solving one particular task, but you're learning general information that's useful across the board. So um, the idea of transfer learning had really been explored in the past, um, but some of the earlier works would assume that um, one would have access to curated public data with task specific annotations. And this is really some of the early works which uh, studied, let's say CIFAR 100 to CIFAR 10 transfer. But uh, with, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, with the modern uh, self-supervised pre-training approaches, you could actually um, get really good features um, or a model that knows language, for example, by uh, a training on mildly curated public data. And uh, the idea is that uh, since the public data um, wouldn't require, wouldn't contain labels, it's actually not that expensive to collect. 
And the, uh, the subsequent uh, DP fine tuning stage uh, would be quite cheap because uh, you don't need a super huge um, private data set. Um, so uh, this was a work essentially from last year. Um, and we showed that you know, fine tuning increasingly better and larger pre-trained models with DP um, would consistently give you improved performance um, in terms of the privacy utility trade-off um, it turns out that this could actually outperform um, some heuristic approaches. Then this is sort of um, the figure that I um, always attach to, you know, either talks or papers uh, or, or uh, summaries of my research. And the idea here is that, um, you know, for text classification and text generation, as you scale the model size, you could get increasingly better results. And some of these results would uh, approach the non-private versions of the uh, uh, fine-tuned models in a smaller scale, uh, and they would beat um, uh, certain heuristic approaches. So um, we've worked a lot on pushing this idea to the extreme, and uh, in a recent um, work, we've tried fine-tuning GPT-3, um, which is the 175 billion uh, version of the pre-trained model. Uh, with differential privacy. And it, it turns out that um, we eventually got past performance at epsilon equals to one, um, better than what you could get by fine tuning the largest GPT-2 um, without DP. And this was uh, for a fairly small summarization data set. Um, so getting this result was, uh, um, I, I wouldn't say the most challenging, but uh, it was definitely um, technically non-trivial, and it required some amount of uh, algorithmic and engineering developments. Um, and one of the things that uh, we found useful was that um, GPT-3 is really this model which cannot be fit on a single uh, accelerator. Um, and, and the reason is quite obvious because uh, um, the model is so large. It's uh, more than 100 times larger than the previously um, largest fine-tuned model in the DP space. Um, so we ended up um, uh, adopting this, uh, what we call per device clipping approach. Um, so um, I haven't really covered the slide of uh, gradient clipping, but uh, the idea in DP training is that you would need to clip gradients and this is individual gradients, not the average gradients. Um, and usually this is where the computational uh, bottleneck comes from. Um, and actually if you clip the gradients, um, of each model piece on its hosted device, then um, this really works well with uh, distributed uh, training strategies like pipeline parallelism. And uh, we were able to essentially use this and get um, the results uh, in this table. Um, so this is with a, a, low, uh, a low rank fine tuning technique, uh, a lightweight fine tuning technique called LoRa. Um, and it turns out that, uh, you know, especially for this model, um, going from epsilon equals to four to epsilon equals to one, you don't get that much performance drop, um, but you do get a lot of performance drop going from epsilon equals to one to epsilon equals to uh, 0.25. Um, we've tried this for some other tasks and it seemed uh, the model is quite resistant to noise um, somehow. Uh, yeah, we, uh, there's some aspects of you know, why it works that we don't fully understand yet, but uh, this is sort of very encouraging empirical results. Um, and, and some of the questions, by the way, come uh, that comes up a lot is, uh, how does this compare to, uh, let's say, uh, few shot in context learning? Um, and this is like a digression. So uh, if you aren't familiar with in context learning, that's fine, just ignore this part. But uh, my, uh, um, take home message um, that I would put out there is that uh, it, it seems at least for this problem, there is merit still for DP fine tuning in the sense that um, even with four shot in context learning, um, it's really hard to attain the same level of performance as you would get with a uh, DP and fine tuning um, at epsilon equals to one. <clears throat> um, yeah, so the second component of really addressing the privacy utility trade-off that we found um, really important was hyperparameter tuning. Um, and there are quite a few past works on this, but uh, we just thought that uh, 
we needed to run some careful experiments. So the thing that we found in the end was that uh, hyperparameters that work well for standard training, um, they don't necessarily work well for private training. And uh, so we, we ran some careful ablations and on, on the left is a ablation study where you would uh, vary the batch size and learning rate and then keep everything else the same. Um, everything else, including um, uh, the number of epochs um, and, and the privacy epsilons. Um, and it turns out that uh, <clears throat> the typical setup for a standard fine tuning is really something um, that is somewhat in the grid um, on the lower left, which is you know small learning rate and small batch size. So that's what people usually do for a uh, non-private uh, or standard fine tuning. Uh, but it turns out that um, to get really good res results in this space, um, what's actually important is to you know use large batch batches, and you would also adjust learning rate as accordingly. Um, the clipping norm story is a bit different, but uh, the idea is also uh, fairly straightforward. Um, in practice, it seems you know having a small clipping norm is more helpful. Um, but uh, there, there are marginal gains after um, the clipping norm is smaller than some threshold. Okay, so I guess for the practitioner out there who would like to try out these methods, the general rule of thumb is really that, um, you know, set the per example gradient um, clipping threshold to be small and tune the learning rate. Uh, by the way, this is something uh, Florian taught me. Um, and uh, the other component is that, uh, um, it's really helpful to train with large batches for a large number of updates. Um, and uh, we wanna, what I wanna say here is that um, with appropriate hyperparameters, um, you could get really, um, you could go really far with just direct fine tuning. Um, and it could really be a lot of the more complicated approaches. And this was one of the experiments we had last year where uh, you know, we essentially fine tuned these uh, language understanding models uh, sorry, these Roberta models for language understanding problems. And, you know, uh, passwords they've considered, and, and this was actually the only password before our work um, in the space, was that, um, you know, complicated approach with gradient projection um, will give you um, somewhat good results, but it turns out that if you just tune your hyperparameters carefully, uh, you don't even have to be super careful. It just have to be in the right range you would get um, quite reasonable results. And sometimes it outperforms the more complicated approach. Um, this is likely a digression, but I still want to cover it. So um, um, there are certain aspects that seem very heuristic with the hyperparameter tuning um, experiments that we've done, but this is something that I think is uh, somewhat principled. So, uh, we study this thing, which is called effective noise multiplier. And it's in sort of one of the middle sections of our 2021 paper. And the idea here really is that um, we wanted to, uh, at the time I wanted to get a, a sensible way of tuning these hyperparameters without, you know, running these um, grid search experiments. So I, I thought about, you know, what would sort of determine uh, what I call the effective noise multiplier um, that is being added due to privacy. So the setup here is that if you fix the number of updates, the gradient updates, and if, it, if you fix the privacy budget and learning rates, um, um, the, the idea here is that um, essentially we could see performance improves as what I call the effective noise multiplier reduces. So the effective noise multiplier is defined by uh, your noise multiplier sigma. So sigma is your noise multiplier returned by sort of a privacy accountant. And Q is a sampling rate. So you could think of that as, you know, the, loosely as the batch size divided by the data set size. So it turns out that uh, if you fix the number of updates, um, this is actually a crucial bit. You can't fix the number of epochs. You must fix the number of updates in this setup. Um, in the setup, if you increase the sampling rate <clears throat> or the batch size, the effective noise multiplier essentially uh, decreases. Um, and this effective noise is really um, what is, you know, bothering this training dynamics. Um, and in, this, in the sense that uh, empirically, um, you'll see that as the effective noise multiplier decreases, the performance actually becomes better in terms of, um, you know, the, the direct metric. 
So here uh, we did the experiment on E2E. So um, the evaluation metric is really the uh, per token negative log likelihood. Um, so uh, I, I also want to point out uh, something interesting, which is that uh, there was a recent work um, that really extended these ideas and uh, created something that is fairly new, in my opinion. Um, and they actually uh, went out and, and built these uh, scaling laws for tuning hyperparameters. And um, with these scaling laws, they were able to tune hyperparameters uh, at sort of the low compute um, region and sort of extrapolate that to the high compute region. Um, and in practice, what they do is, you know, they tune with small batch sizes and uh, reuse the best hyperparameters found there to uh, train their uh, large batch size workflows. Um, and, uh, you know, with this sort of approach, they really got um, sort of performance on uh, ImageNet um, DP training. Okay, so um, that's uh, mostly what's about the privacy utility trade-off. And uh, we'll go into the computational efficiency. So um, the idea here is that the core primitive of DP deep learning, uh, which is DP stochastic gradient descent, uh, usually just called DP SGD, it requires clipping, for example, gradients uh, for each um, update. Um, and the passworks um, mostly have instantiated this, for example, gradient in their implementation. And uh, as a consequence, you know, um, some of them would report very high memory um, spending. Um, and this is uh, really painful for a practitioner um, if you worked on these methods. Um, and, and let me just uh, sort of give you guys a brief recap of what is going on. So uh, on the right, we have um, this DPSGD uh, pseudo algorithm, uh, pseudo code box. It's from um, one of the original papers, um, the Abadi paper. Um, and the idea here is that, you know, we need to control the sensitivity. So we end up, you know, clipping individual gradients um, by this threshold C. And uh, this operation is kind of seemingly incompatible with uh, modern autodiff libraries, um, but it turns out that, okay, sorry. So, but if you look at sort of this clipping equation carefully, you'll see that um, what's really important um, is actually the gradient norm. So once you have the gradient norm, um, <clears throat> the other stuff would uh, come quite naturally. So gradient clipping really um, is bottlenecked by how fast or how efficient you could compute this gradient norm. So um, we uh, came up with this uh, extension, uh, which I named it ghost clipping, um, and it enables clipping and summing gradients without computing and instantiating individual gradients. And the way it works is really by, you know, decomposing the gradient into different blocks and computing the gradient norm of uh, the gradient of each block and then aggregating at the end. Um, so it, it's like all of the heavy lifting is uh, broken down um, and you're processing uh, different gradients um, uh, not simultaneously, but sequentially. And uh, turns out that you would get much better memory scaling at the cost of uh, a slight computational overhead. Um, and this is one of the uh, profile profiling results we uh, had last year. Um, turns out that um, um, just using this technique, uh, you could uh, get uh, sort of close to non-private um, training um, max batch sizes, um, which is really close to non-private uh, training memory in some cases. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> excuse me. So uh, we really wanted to push this idea um, um, in a subsequent work. Um, so what we've done very recently is that um, we study this variant of clipping, which is uh, you know, what we call per layer clipping. And it has been somewhat studied in um, the literature, um, but not from a very uh, careful um, point of view of computational efficiency um, and performance. Um, so um, I probably won't go into the details of the algorithm, but uh, I'll just say that per layer clipping removes um, the computational overhead that you would experience um, in, let's say, ghost clipping or other types of clipping modes. And it, it really allows reading clipping to be performed in conjunction with back propagation. 
And um, uh, empirically, we see that for certain workflows, DP training with per layer clipping could be as memory and uh, almost as time efficient per update as standard training. So on the right, we have this uh, throughput um, figure um, and the blue bar is the non-private uh, or standard training workflow. And the red one is uh, per layer clipping. And uh, for this particular problem, we see that uh, across the board um, for different models, um, per layer clipping is roughly 15% uh, slower uh, in terms of the throughput. Um, one technical detail is that per layer clipping with the uh, fixed clipping thresholds, um, and, and this is a uh, fix for each layer. Um, so this would uh, sometimes underperform standard flat, flat clipping. And uh, part of this had been observed in past works, uh, but uh, we found that if you sort of adapt the clipping thresholds during training, um, you could sort of get rid of any potential performance losses. Um, and one technical thing is that uh, the question, you know, of you know how do you adapt naturally arises, and uh, the idea is that you would uh, one way of uh, adapting is to uh, use the estimated uh, gradient norm quantiles. Um, and turns out that you know um, with the adapted per layer clipping, you could get um, you know faster training, and at the same time, um, no, literally uh, or almost no uh, sacrifice in terms of performance. Okay, so uh, that was the empirical stuff. Um, so now we'll go into um, sort of the more academic aspect of this talk, which is, you know, fine tuning hundreds of millions of parameters um, really works, but uh, what is the reason of this and why does it seem quite different from um, the past works uh, which have studied this problem both in theory and practice? So um, I guess the, uh, just to set, um, set up this stage, um, one common wisdom in private learning is that um, optimizing more parameters is um, worse than uh, optimizing fewer uh, in terms of final performance. And um, you could see um, you know, in convex ERM or convex, uh, or at convex SEO, um, you could get these uh, error bounds and, and this is uh, um, one of the error bounds you would get with the epsilon delta DP uh, for a convex learning problem. So uh, it turns out that um, you know this bound is a uh, is sort of both the upper and lower bound, um, and the D um, parameter here is really the dimension of the problem instance, or essentially the number of parameters you would optimize. And you'll see that um, this sort of worst case error would grow with the dimensionality of your problem instance. Uh, but um, if you look at what's happening in practice, you'll also sort of see a similar thing, which is that um, the noise you would add for privacy, especially for large models, um, this noise component will really have equal variance, uh, a typically equal variance for real coordinates. Um, and at the end of the day, um, if you measure the noise in terms of L2 norm, you'll see that it greatly exceeds gradient in magnitude for very large models. Um, and I'll comment that uh, there are some works which uh, really try to make the noise iso uh, anisotropic. Um, there are a lot of works on this, but I won't go into that for this talk. Okay, so um, the magnitude of noise added during each step of DPSGD is uh, sort of scaling as square root of D. Uh, this is like a typical uh, Gaussian random vector concentration bound. Um, and this really means that optimizing more parameters um, will give you noisy optimization. Um, and there were a lot of works um, in the literature in the past which hypothesized that um, this could be the main reason that DP deep learning doesn't work well. Um, and just as a bit of a reminder, you know, this is the Argo box from um, the 2016 Abadi paper, and um, it sort of gave one of the first um, algorithms, DPSGD. And the noise vector here is uh, isotropic and it grows in magnitude of the problem dimension. Um, so what we've found in past work is that empirical results really suggest otherwise. You could sort of densely fine tune a model or spicy fi fine tune a model and the results you get don't seem that different in practice. So this is one of the experiments um, we've done last year and you could see that um, uh, so full, 
means full fine tuning, which is dense fine tuning. And, um, you know, this is really fine tuning a model like GBT2, which has 100 million parameters. And the other uh, methods like LoRa, Prefix, and RGP are sparse fine tuning methods. And they have, you know, um, 10 to 1,000 times fewer parameters than dense fine tuning. And in terms of like the final task metric performance, you know, they seem pretty similar. Uh, except for prefix and RGP, um, which are substantially worse. Um, so um, turns out that there are works in the theory literature which look at um, the error of um, private convex empirical risk minimization. And uh, these works essentially show that um, the error bound that you get might not actually depend on the ambient dimension. Um, if the collection of gradients, um, you know, evaluated across your, your whole space is either low rank. Um, so this is the password. So they've considered, let's say things like linear models and low rank data, generalized linear models. Um, and in our work, we've extended the sign of work to look at cases where the gradients are sort of near low rank. Um, and it's really this, this low rank structure, which uh, um, gives you sort of this uh, ambient dimension independent results. Um, okay, so um, why does the error of unconstrained private convex uh, learning problems don't depend on, uh, the error bounds of that don't depend on um, uh, the ambient dimension. So let's look at um, this toy example. Okay, so let's look at this uh, um, this loss function f x y. So it's um, you know a problem where you get a scalar output loss, um, but you have two coordinates that are being op optimized. Um, and uh, the the reason I'm using Huber loss um, is because it's locally quadratic, but it's uh, linear uh, extending to infinity. So you don't need to flip the gradients. Um, it has naturally um, bounded sensitivity. Um, so imagine this was uh, the empirical loss. So this was the average loss you, you would get. So if you were to optimize this function, then you really realize that the gradients of f of x, y, if you look at any point of this gradient, uh, the gradient of any uh, point evaluated in space, um, you'll see that it's mostly perpendicular to line x equals to zero. So um, the intuition here really is that, you know, if you just, you know, cut off this objective at a Y value, you'll see sort of this uh, very sort of steep uh, dis descent and then this uh, ascent back again. So, you know, the curvature here is uh, quite high. Um, but if you sort of cut the um, loss in terms of, you know, um, you know, fixing a certain X value, you'll see that the function really grows very slowly. So um, this, this function is what we sort of call near low rank in the sense that um, the gradients, if you look at the X component, um, it, it's really low. But if you look at the, uh, um, the, the, the Y component, the, the component that is perpendicular to uh, X equal to zero, then um, that component is quite high. So the thing to um, really ponder about is that the noise perturbation along the y-axis, which sort of perturbs our loss along this uh, um, low growth direction, really marginally affects the loss value. Whereas if you were to perturb um, heavily along, um, um, you know, this is x-axis direction, um, then you would get large changes in loss. And that is sort of uh, our intuition for why this happens, or at least my intuition. Okay, so um, I won't go into the details of this, but uh, as it turns out, we uh, observed that um, the gradients um, you would get from fine tuning large language models have sort of this low rank structure. Uh, and uh, we ran this interesting retraining experiment where you would sort of you know, train, identify the subspace, then project only the gradients uh, onto the subspace, but not the noise. So the noise is still as large as before and you, essentially manually um, shrunk the signal of the, of the gradients. And if you optimize in this way, you'll still be able to recover your original performance um, once the subspace is uh, large enough. And by large enough, it's like 100 dimensions is somewhat efficient for certain problems. Um, so um, 
a bit of a digression is that um, this DP fine tuning thing uh, has seen some adoption at Microsoft. And one of the applications that we've done is uh, what we call differentiated private synthetic text generation. Um, and there are actually quite a, uh, quite a few um, areas at Microsoft that are trying to adopt um, you know, this DP fine tuning thing, but this is something that we ended up writing a paper on. Um, so this problem really is studying how do you, um, you know, build generative models of text um, with differential privacy. Um, and this is really cool because, um, you know, you could sample synthetic data from this generative model and you could use the synthetic data as freely as you like, and you wouldn't, um, you know, incur any extra privacy loss than what was used to train the original model. Um, so we actually, you know, tried this on actual, you know, actual private data. Um, so we fine tune a language model on an internal private feedback data set collected from customers. Um, and we are getting very promising results at epsilon equals to eight uh, so far. Okay, so the last part I'm gonna talk about briefly is uh, what we call privacy calibration trade-off. So um, there's some unexpected observation in this space, um, but before going into that, um, let's look a little bit at what calibration is. So calibration studies, if a classifier's predicted probabilities are meaningful, that's the intuitive definition that I would give. Um, and um, the reason you would like calibrated predictions is that, is that it really um, help you reason about uncertainty. Um, and this is quite important in high stakes setups. And you can imagine, you know, if you were to train a private uh, model on medical uh, images based on private patient data, you would really want the model to convey meaningful uncertainty. Um, and there are also more practical reasons, right? So calibrated classifiers, they tend to ensemble better. And um, they're argued to work well with things like selective classification and active learning. Um, and, you know, just to throw out the formal definition, uh, a classifier is said to be calibrated if, um, you know, if you look at its predicted probability and if it's P. And if you look at the set of examples which predict probability P and it gets the right class, then uh, on average, um, this. Um, probability of predicting the right class would still be P. So that is um, intuitively the definition of calibration. Uh, so typical evaluations of a calibration in this space include, um, you know, computing um, what's called the expected calibration error, ECE, and maximum calibration error, MCE, and inspe inspecting the reliability diagram. Okay, so um, there's some works in this space and it's, uh, these works are kind of famous. Uh, so standard training of neural networks can bring miscalibration. And this is uh, attributed to overfitting. Um, so as it turns out that uh, DP trained models can be worse in terms of calibration. And there's some simple studies um, in the past. Um, but what we observe really is that, um, you know, we, we take a deeper dive and we look at, you know, whether this is um, occurring across the board or is it just isolated cases. And it turns out that, um, you know, we empirically see um, miscalibration, uh, higher miscalibration um, for these DP models um, across uh, many, many workflows, even with the state of the art accuracy models um, and generally across vision and language. And one of the things we found is that, you know, DPSGD in particular, the, for example, gradient would uh, sort of cause your model to be overconfident um, on test examples. Um, and here's sort of one of our core results. So across, you know, four NLP data sets and three vision data sets, we see that, you know, ECE, which is the measure of miscalibration, um, you know, increases as you switch to DP. Um, and by the way, higher EC is worse. Um, okay, so um, we uh, ended up proposing a fix, which is private recalibration. And the method is quite simple. So you would split your original private training data set into um, two portions. And um, the first portion is uh, what you would use for training. So this is detrain. So you would train or fine tune on detrain to perform the task. And this is with DP. Um, and um, the next step is to take this model and run some you know, post hoc recalibration procedure. 
uh, with the other split, which is what we call D-recal. Um, and this, this particular uh, process has to also be uh, differentially private. And things you could try are uh, privatized temperature or plat scaling. And uh, in practice, we, had, uh, we see that um, you know, this substantially improves uh, calibration. And this is one of the uh, vision data sets. And, and you could see on the left, this was uh, what you would get by training with DP. The model you know, mostly assigns confidence to uh, um, you know, the bins roughly you know, uh, 0.96 or 97 or something like that. But after you do the um, recalibration, you know, the model confidence is much more spread out and um, the reliability diagram is much more uh, sort of closer to the uh, diagonal. Yeah, so um, you might wonder, uh, does this sort of, sort of hurt accuracy because you are taking away examples to train your um, DP model? Um, and it turns out that it doesn't quite reduce accuracy and uh, you wouldn't sort of get a big drop in terms of accuracy by, uh, you know, moving away 10% of the examples that you would have originally used for uh, training your model. Um, okay, so uh, just to summarize um, uh, what we've covered. Um, so um, uh, the take home message I, I really want to put out is that, you know, DP deep learning uh, can give performance models with good public pre-training and hyperparameter tuning. Um, so uh, since DP is sort of a formal guarantee and uh, it is sort of so far the most trusted, I, I think, you know, it, it's really important that uh, um, um, the uh, practitioner would sort of try, try this out first before going into, um, you know, looking at the uh, informal or heuristic privacy approaches. Um, and, you uh, um, DPSGD can really be instantiated to be both memory and time efficient. And we've showed, uh, we've shown that sometimes it can be as efficient as non-private learning per gradient update. Um, but um, DPSGD may still require more gradient updates in practice. So this is also my experience. And thus it, it is likely slower still in practice, um, but is not as slow as people um, would think. Um, um, so the idea here is that training and test errors of DPSG might not necessarily scale with your problem dimension. And this is uh, this can occur for both pro convex problems and practical neural network problems. Um, the final thing is that DPSGD results in worse calibration, um, but private recalibration really mitigates this. Um, in the end, I wanna you know, include some ethics discussions um, just sort of uh, to uh, really consolidify things. Um, the thing I want to say is that, you know, DP is by far the, the trusted solution to prevent models from uh, memorizing individual examples. Um, but um, we also want to say that DP is not the panacea to all privacy problems. So it shouldn't be the case that, um, you know, somebody uh, really goes out there and say that I use DP, so there's no privacy harm. So that is not true. Um, you know, privacy harms can occur at data collection, and this is sort of widely studied, for, for instance, in social sciences and law. Um, and one thing that I really want to say that we really, really need to be careful about DP, using DP in production, is that in order for DP guarantees to translate into meaningful real-world privacy guarantees, um, we must carefully reason about the data generation process and to think about uh, what exactly is appropriate um, what exactly is the appropriate example boundary? Um, and the thing is, uh, if we aren't super careful enough, then uh, um, you know, um, the, the more obvious case is that you might get uh, data duplication in your data set, and then um, the DP guarantee might not actually give you um, the strong privacy guarantee that you like. Um, the other aspect is that our works and several follow-ups uh, have really shown that DP fine tuning is effective but I also want to put out there that um, um, DP fine tuning or DP machine learning being effective, this alone should not be the core motivation to expand the data collection of sensitive data um, or to aggressively train machine learning models on such, such data. Uh, so we, we must think carefully before uh, we use private data in terms of the ethical considerations. Um, and the final bit is that when we sort of you know do this DP machine learning, and and I'm somewhat confident that we'll see sort of more models of DP uh, DP trained models deployed in the future, is that uh, we should really also study sort of the trade-offs between privacy and the aspects of uh, 
trustworthy machine learning. And, uh, you know, in the past, we've seen that, you know, as you include these privacy guarantees, the fairness aspects usually degrade. Um, and we've seen this paper, uh, sorry, in this talk that you might get worse calibration, which is another aspect of trustworthy machine learning. So it, it's really uh, crucial that we study the trade-offs carefully. Um, yeah, and uh, that's the end of my talk and I'd like to thank you. Um, and this is the list of works that uh, are included in this talk. And uh, unfortunately, some of these works aren't yet uh, archived yet, but uh, we are working on it.